Hello everyone. Uh, good to see you all here after lunch. I hope your belly is full and you're ready for a, a, a good deep dive. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk a lot about error prone today. Uh, I, I did a conference talks, uh, talk about this a few times, also some longer workshops, but never a deep dive uh, like this. So I'm trying some new concepts today and we will just see how it goes. I would love to have a lot of interaction in between. We will do some uh, coding sessions, some live coding sessions and uh, yeah, let's see how all these uh, tryouts and new things will go. So um, yeah, let's start. I would, like to sh I would like to start with sharing one of my biggest frustrations with you. But before I do, I would like to ask you two questions. So who of you does regular code reviews? Good, I see quite some hands, that's good. Who of you has ever pointed out some common code coding guidelines or some subtle code style issues or bugs during this code review? Good, I hope to see a lot of hands, because this is directly related to my biggest frustration. Because when I start to review a pull request of a colleague of mine, I see quite a few things, I write some comments, which in itself is of course not a problem. But I get slightly annoyed when it's the fourth time that week that I'm pointing out the same thing during a pull request review. Because I start to wonder, why do I need to manually write a comment about this? Why can't we simply automate this? Well, that's exactly what this deep dive is going to be about. I'm going to show you a solution to this problem. We're going to automatically improve code bases with error prone. And error prone is a static analysis tool for Java uh, that we're going to use uh, as a solution. So first, a little bit about me. Uh, I like doing uh, talks at conferences because you get to travel. Uh, I get to talk about my work. I'm a software engineer uh, at an online supermarket. But uh, yeah, besides that, I get to go to these conferences. And what is nice about it is that I can uh, yeah, go a bit through the city beforehand, afterwards. And here are some pictures of yesterday. Uh, this time, I even brought my mother uh, to the conference, which is nice because we get to travel together and see some uh, nice things of Luxembourg. Um, yeah, that's it about me. Uh, let's go over the uh, agenda of today. Uh, first, I'm going to give you a bit more context about uh, yeah, some of the, the processes or like guidelines that we have around standardizations and uh, how to get rid of repetitive discussions. Then uh, we, I'm going to introduce you to error prone and read faster. Um, then uh, about an, an open source project that we have as an as online supermarket. The name, by the way, is, is Picnic. I will talk a bit more about that. Um, yeah, and then we're going to the, the, the big part about the, the deep dive into both ReFaster and error prone. And uh, I will also show you how, after you know what error prone and ReFaster are, that you can also actually start introducing these things in your company, in the code bases that you're working on. And I'm going to show you some lessons learned at, uh, about how we do that at Picnic. Um, so it's a full package, but uh, yeah, then you know everything there is to know, at least the baseline of what you need to know about error prone to start using it. So um, about standardizations and review, uh, repetitive dis getting rid of repetitive discussions. One of the things that we uh, experience and know as a developer is that you have to read code a lot more than you write code. And a big part of this is about understand, understanding the code that you're reading. So I really like this source of uh, Feliene uh, Hermans who says developer, developers on average spend as much as 58% of their time on uh, comprehending existing source code. Source code. So that is a, uh, yeah, just an insane amount of time that we have to go over code and start to understand it. So what we really try to do as a company is make sure that this part, reading and understanding the code, gets as we want to make it as easy as possible with making sure that everything is really similar and it's very easy to understand. Making sure that we can automatically uh, make uh, complex code uh, simpler. And there are many things that we have to, to focus on this. Uh, and to help the de to guide the, de the developers with actually doing this. And another important aspect is um, we want to eliminate the bike shedding that is happening during the code reviews. What does that mean? Well, there is this uh, nice example of uh, the explanation of the bike shed effect. What you see here is that they are going to build a nuclear. Um, one step back. What is it actually? Um, the bike shed effect is about the fact that a lot of people are wasting time discussing very trivial things while they should actually focus on the things that are way more important and impactful. 
the example here is that they have a plan to build a nuclear power plant, and uh, well, that costs a lot of money versus the bike shed that belongs to that plan, only costs a uh, thousand euros, uh, dollars in this example. But there are not many experts on the very difficult part, so there are not a lot of discussions happening. But on the bike shed, everyone can have an opinion about what the color should be or whatever. So there's a lot of discussion happening on that, while it's a very trivial issue. Now you might wonder, okay, nice example, but what does this mean for code? Well, I have a very beautiful example. Uh, let's say someone uh, wrote some code, and there is this very simple code style issue where someone says, hey, you have a method invocation is empty, but I don't like that we, uh, within the team, made an agreement that we should use e uh, the equals with an empty string. Well, this is uh, yeah, a stylistic issue, doesn't really matter which one you pick, but what you can see is that someone, uh, as my profile picture, uh, wrote a comment on this, said, hey, I thought we agreed on using method A instead of using method B, while they are doing the same thing. And there are some upvotes on this uh, comment, so what could happen is that more developers are going to read this and they are going to post their opinion about why they strongly feel about one or the other. Of course, this is a simple example, but you can think of many uh, examples here. Um, and then you have in this, this pull request a very localized discussion about this. And that is something we would really like to prevent. Because let's say you, ha you work in a team, you have all these, these coding guidelines, you have an agreed upon set of, of rules for your code. But then you switch teams and there they have different code style things that you need to relearn or you strongly disagree with them. So you need to have these repetitive discussions again about something very simple. So what we try to do is we say, okay, you can have this discussion once, but then you need to settle on something, preferably with the whole company, and then you need to make sure that you enforce one over the other, such that if someone writes this code, it says, hey, I automatically rewrote it to the first one because that's the one we agreed upon. Again, very simple example, uh, but there are many of these uh, simple things that we can automate such that we don't need discussions about those again. Let me show you a few simple uh, comments that, uh, that you get, could get on a GitHub pull request. Please use immutable list.of instead of collections.empty list. A very simple one, both do roughly the same thing. Uh, test method should not be public. And another one is make sure to add the final keyword. So there's always someone in the team who really feels strong about either the finals or the, the me method that should not or should be public. Um, these are all things that we should actually try to automate. And uh, within Picnic, we have quite a lot of tools that help the developers point out these different things, such that we don't need these discussions. A very uh, important one is the use of a formatter. Can I see some hands? Who within, uh, within the code base that you're working on has an automated formatter? Not as much as I would hope for, but uh, well, this is one that saved, uh, for at least within our company, already years of development hours with simply introducing one formatter. Because there are no discussions possible about where to put the curly bracket, do we have a new line in between? Because you simply run format and your code is completely uh, formatted via, uh, in a very opinionated way because we use a Google Java format. Um, but yeah, it really helped us a lot. And there are many more of these tools that point out uh, bugs uh, in your code. Uh, for example, the static analysis tools like Sonar Cloud, Checkstyle and Spotbugs. We believe these to be the industry proven best practices, so we also use them internally. So these tools can, uh, can find, they, they analyze your code and they say, hey, here's a bug and there's a bug, please fix it. But still, it means that once it found something, you as a developer need to check out the code, you need to manually uh, apply the changes, and then you have to push, push it again. Um, that's something we don't really like. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a good start, but we want to do more because it still involves the developer doing some manual work and looking, up at looking, looking it up in the code, applying it whatsoever. So that brings us uh, to the next thing because we started to wonder, can we actually do more? Well, that brings us to uh, my favorite, par favorite part because here I get to say, allow me to introduce you to error prone. What is error prone? Error prone is a static analysis tool uh, for Java. Uh, it can not only find and detect bugs in your code, but it can also automatically apply fixes for you. So how does that work? Um, it's a tool created by Google, uh, but it's a compiler plugin. So what does that mean? It runs 
every time you do uh, you compile your code. So let's say you're doing a Maven clean install. Uh, you have a simple uh, Java class. The compiler starts compiling it, starts to do a lot of extra checking. Is it a valid program? Uh, uh, extra type checking, naming resolutions, a lot of things. And then when it's done, it has a lot of context about your simple Java program. What, it what error prone then does, it hooks into the compiler after uh, it is done and it says, hey, I'm using your extra context to do a much more thorough analysis and try to find bugs in the code. And the cool thing is that if it finds something, it will still have a link to the actual source code and say, hey, you wrote this code, I found a problem, and this is how you can fix your code. Let me give you an example of how that would look like. So if you just compile without the automa automated fix, what it does, it says, hey, uh, I found some code, I wrote some, uh, some ugly code, say uh, a string on which we call a substring, uh, and yeah, if we don't, uh, use the, the result, if we don't put it again in a string, it's basically a no-op, it do doesn't do anything. So what it says here is, hey, return value ignored, uh, return uh, value of substring must be used. So it says, did you mean example is, and then uh, what I wrote. So indeed, I only wrote this part, but yeah, either I have to remove this line or I have to prefix it with this to actually make it mean something. So it can actually it, here it literally says, did you mean to write this code? But if I then run error prone in patch mode, it will also automatically fix this for me, and I don't need to do anything about it. So let's say you have a very large code base, and you uh, enable one of the 500 bug patterns that are provided by Google on this code base, it will, it will go over your whole code base, find all the violations, and then automatically fix them for you. So it's a really powerful tool. But uh, you can also write your own checks, but there's one downside to error prone, and that is that writing your own checks can get quite complex. We will dive into that a bit later, but you have to work with the abstract syntax tree of your code, and that can be uh, a bit hard depending on what you would like to fix. So what they, uh, what they did at Google, they thought, okay, we want to make it very easy to um, let people define their own refactorings. So what they did is they built a tool on top of error prone, and that tool is called Refaster. And the idea of Refaster is that uh, by using a before template, you can say, hey, I want to match this code in the code base. And if you find it, rewrite it to the content I give in the after template. Let me show you an example. So what we see here is we have a before template, and what is important is this part, the method body, where we say that we want to match a string where we use uh, the method invocation equals, and we would like to rewrite that to the content that is given in the after template. Oh, sorry, this is my uh, an alarm. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, and the cool thing about this is that you're, um, what you can see is that there is a pra oh, parameter uh, string there, what, uh, which means that when refaster is analyzing your code, it will uh, put in uh, the refast rule, all expressions that are of type string. So an example is here that this is an arbitrary string field in an if, uh, uh, if statement, and it will, see, it will check, hey, is some string field, does it use equals? Well, it does, so this is a match, and then when we apply this, it would simply rewrite it to the dot is empty. Um, again, this is, is a very simple example of a refaster rule, but you can do many uh, things with refaster, and we will also uh, take a look at that, of course, during the, the deep dive part. Um, yeah. So, I'm going to show you a demonstration because I can. Oh, there's a question. That's of course. That's okay. Yes. So the question is, if we would, instead of having this uh, string field, we would have a function called uh, to a method that returns a string, and then use equals, if it then would match? Yes, it would. And that's exactly why. So it's important to note that this refaster rule doesn't get actually executed by, uh, by refaster. It's basically a domain-specific language on how to define refactoring operations. So it takes this or your uh, method call, and it puts it then in, in there, and then it will check, hey, does it match, yes or no? And then it rewrites it. So very good question. Uh, yes, it does match that. So 
I can talk a lot about this, but it's a lot nicer if we, of course, uh, if I show you uh, a few things. But before we dive into the demo, I want to show to explain you a little bit more, so that it's easier to understand throughout the whole uh, deep dive what we are seeing sometimes. So uh, I'm going to work with Maven, but this also works for other build systems like Gradle, Bazel, uh, for example. Um, so with this Maven thing, we have a, a normal Maven build, and what we're going to do, we're going to add configuration on top of that. And we're going to do that via Maven profiles. So, um, yeah, let me just show you. There is the, the error prone profile, which, which says, hey, I have a Maven build, and if I pass minus P and then error prone, then it enables uh, some configuration that we see here. Well, uh, you can see a laser pointer. Yes. So, uh, what it does, it says, hey, I'm hooking into the Maven compiler plugin, and then I want to enable the plugin error prone. And then I can uh, say which checks I want to enable or disable. Uh, and here's a simple example where we say, hey, there, the Java 8 API checker, we want to disable that. Um, so that's the first thing. First, we run error prone. And then the second profile is the patch profile, which also goes on top, which says whatever error prone found, please also automatically fix it for us. So there's these, these two modes. So now, for, uh, for real, let's go to the demo. That's this one. And I have a few questions for you, because you see a very uh, simple uh, clause here, demo clause, of course. Uh, one second. Oh. One dot too much. I had recently had to uh, reinstall everything on my laptop, so it's not uh <laughs> perfect yet. But uh, yes. So. You see a very simple clause here. Is it readable in the back? Yes, I see some nodding faces. Good. Uh, there are three methods, and in every method, there is something that can actually be improved or is, or is even wrong. And I would like to ask you, just shout some ideas, or uh, what is wrong with some of these uh, methods? In the back there. Line 16. Indeed, we already have an immutable set, and we're doing a copy off, which is not necessary. Good one. Throw is missing in line 10. Indeed, we're creating a new illegal argument exception, but not throwing it, so actually it's not doing anything. Is empty. Indeed, we have an is empty method with the string length equals zero. Could be an is empty. Well, um, Good suggestions. Let's see what error prone thinks. And this is exactly where we're going to use the profile. So we have Maven clean install, and then minus P error prone to add the error prone part. So not the patch one yet. And let's see what it finds. <coughs> it's a bit slow. OK, there it is. Was printing out some things. Uh, so indeed, we have a refast rule on line 21. If we scroll down, that's this one. It says, hey, did you mean return string dot is empty? Well, indeed. The other one is a dead exception, exception created but not thrown. Did you mean throw new legal argument exception on line 10? That's exactly what we wanted to do. And the other is identity conversion uh, right here. Did you mean return set or suppress the warning? And please note that what you can see here is that there is also a link to the documentation, which we will see uh, later. But if you are wondering why is this a dead exception, what does it mean, you can simply click on it and you will get a lot more um, information on the documentation website. But now, of course, uh, I'm not someone who wants to manually fix this. Now it's only three things, but let's say you're enabling a new thing. It would, would take way too much work to do this. So I add the minus P patch profile, which adds the configuration on top. And then let's see if I click here. Indeed. Oh, I was just on time. So we see that there the throw keyword is added. We're not uh, doing a copy off here anymore. And we have uh, string dot is empty now. So that's good. Um, what if this string dot length should be here for a very specific reason? Let's say I have an edge case that error prone should not touch. We also have uh, a mechanism for that, of course. We can simply say string is empty, that's the name of the rule that does something with this, um, because I don't want to rewrite this. And please uh, note that what is also nice is that, well, uh, IntelliJ here says, hey, local variable set is redundant in line the variable, 
And um, please also take a look at this because this kind of looks like a check argument. Um, let's see uh, if we run error prone now again. Uh, we should see that the uh, suppressed thing should not be rewritten. It's a bit slower than usual, but uh, then we wait a bit longer. Then I can drink some water. And now it already updated, and we see that uh, here the string.length is still there. So indeed, we can uh, say, hey, this is an edge case. What is also nice is that we now directly return the, uh, the immutable set. And here, instead of the if statement, we now say, please uh, use a check argument. Also quite nice. Um, so you can run error prone a few times, because when it um, made a change, you have to recompile the code, and it can do its analysis again if there are like new things that you can apply and then uh, it can apply it again. So that's a bit on how error prone works in practice. Um, again, th th those are some simple examples, and we're going to see a few more just to give you an idea on what kind of things we can do with error prone. So error prone itself uh, has a documentation website on all the 500 error prone checks on why they are a good thing, uh, why, th wh why they rewrite something, or why you wrote some bad code, and some examples. Uh, and I just want to highlight a few. So this is the, the self-comparison one. If you are writing some code that, and you're actually doing a self-comparison, it will flag that for you. The, others, uh, the other is that, well, if classes override the equals, uh, you should also have the hash code. And if you don't, then uh, you might run into some problems. And there are, also, there are also quite some checks that help you with the use of date times, because yeah, you can easily specify something wrong with dates. Um, and then it will also say, hey, probably you are uh, introducing a bug here. And uh, there are also some, some bug patterns that allow you to uh, flip some, some assumptions, default assumptions or code style um, rules about your code. So let's say you have someone in the team who is really keen on uh, the final keyword, what I already mentioned before, and says, hey, if you have something that's effectively final, so it's not being changed, for example, this string is not being changed afterwards. We want uh, you to add the final keyword everywhere throughout the code base. While the compiler can already infer that it is an effectively uh, final thing, so you don't need to actually add it here. So, uh, what and, and for the ones that you do change, because here we are overriding the value, um, you don't have to do anything. So what if we would have a far bug pattern that allows us to completely flip the default assumption here. So instead of saying, hey, um, we need to add the final keyword, we can say, please omit that. And we assume that if there is nothing like a final keyword or annotation, we know you are not changing it. So the default is now immutable. And if, you're, if you have a variable that you're changing, then uh, you have to make that clear with the var annotation. So it's kind of. So what we can do here is that we can flip the assumption about uh, your code, that if you're writing a local variable without the final keyword, we know it's an immutable thing instead of a mutable thing. And error prone will make sure that if you're introducing some new code and you forgot to add the, the var annotation, it will say, hey, you are changing this, this uh, local variable. Please add the var annotation. So it will help you with that as well. So. Then um, one that uh, everyone is probably familiar with, the optional.get. It got introduced in Java 8, I believe, and then everyone started to extensively use this throughout the whole code base. And later they, they realized, hmm, the naming of the optional.get is not really nice. It's not as we would like to have it. So what they did, they introduced the or else throw. And so this is the Java doc of the optional.get. And it literally says, hey, there's an API node. The preferred alternative to this method is dot or else throw. So if I would review some code and a colleague of mine uh, still using the optional.get, I would have to write, hey, please uh, use the or else throw because that's the one we should be using. So I would be that annoying guy that keeps on saying that during these code reviews. What if we would write one simple refaster rule that simply does this, match an optional.get, rewrite, rewrite it to the dot or else throw, you run it over your code base, and every usage is now automatically fixed. And if someone else introduces optional.get, it will automatically complain, hey, you're introducing something we don't want to use anymore, and it will automatically fix it for you. This saves <laughs> Things like this can, can save you a lot of time. Um, yeah. So 
um, that's it for the introduction of Air Pro, and I read faster. Uh, the, the cool thing is that we at Picnic were such big fans of uh, of these tools that we at some point used almost all the 500 bug patterns that were provided out of the box. And we thought, okay, we want to do even more. We want to make our code base even more consistent, fix more bugs for our developers whatsoever. So what we did is we created a lot of our rules uh, on our own. Uh, we by now have over 900 refaster rules and over 40 uh, bug patterns. And the idea is that we are going quite far with, uh, yeah, uh, let's say it's a picnic opinionated set of rules because we want to go further and further with consistency. I will show you some examples of uh, why I'm saying this so often. And what we also uh, try to help with is automated migrations from, for example, uh, test and G assertions or JUnit assertions to assert J because we prefer that, or uh, automatically migrate test and G uh, tests to JUnit. And we can all do this for the developers uh, w w in one go. And then instead of having multiple frameworks for testing, we have only one. And then it's also easier to optimize if we have a lot of JUnit code, we can also further optimize that with uh, our error prone rules. Um, but besides a lot of rules, we also added quite some modules to make it a lot easier for ourselves to use these tools. So we made, I will show you some examples in a bit, but we made it a lot easier to run read faster rules on your code base. And you can imagine that when, once you're writing 900 read faster rules that you also need to make sure that you're rewriting the correct thing. So we also have a test uh, support because that was also not uh, that extensive. Um, we improved the reporting. What I also showed you for the read faster rules, this, the fact that a read faster rule can omit such a warning is something that error prone itself doesn't provide out of the box. So we introduced support for that. And we have a nice documentation website um, I already showed a bit during the demo oh. um, that uh, you can click on the link to the documentation. Uh, well, we have our for our own checks, we have our own documentation website. So there is the the um, uh, the homepage is the README of the repository and has some explanation on how to integrate it with your build and also with Gradle uh, and some explanations. But the cool thing is that we have a long list of bug patterns. So for example, I I need to. Put on my hotspot. <laughs> Sorry, this will take a second. Nice. So I showed you the direct return check. Uh, it shows some. Oh. Is it readable like that in the back? Nice. Thumbs up. Um, so what we see here <laughs> is that uh, th uh, this is the exact example, uh, example that we saw during, uh, during the demo, um, but we have some other interesting ones. Uh, for example, I wanted to show a specific one. Yes, we also guide developers with how they use APIs. So for example, the SS SLF4J API, if you're trying to print something for that and you're using the percent %s, it basically means that you're not doing anything because it doesn't work like that. You should use the curly bracket so it says, hey, you're using the wrong one, and it automatically fixes it for you. Um, and also an interesting one is that once you have a, a string uh, with a placeholder in there, and you have one placeholder so you can put one thing in, um, but if, if you're using that incorrectly, uh, for example this, uh, here we have here we have this one placeholder, and we're providing two arguments to put in while there's only one, and it will say, hey, please stop, uh, you're doing it incorrectly, and it will point that out for you, which is otherwise quite hard to, to detect. Um, but I mentioned we are quite opinionated, and we want to li uh, eliminate as much discussions as possible. And an interesting example, which, is, uh, which I'm about to show you, is the static import check. We have quite some rules on which things to statically import and which ones to not statically import. So, uh, and this is the quite opinionated part then, where we, let's say, have uh, for a two immutable map. We think that the immutable map in front doesn't really add a lot. So we say, hey, whenever you use this, please automatically import this. Same holds for arguments.arguments, .arguments, and the list goes on and on with quite some quite a few of these things. And for the people that use Spring, another interesting example is where we say, uh, please only uh, derive the current time from an existing uh, clock spring bean, because otherwise you're doing some uh, weird things probably. 
so if you're instantiating your own clock, it will say, please use the spring bean. Um, it's quite a specific one. And for the refaster rules, the same holds. Here we have, as I mentioned, over 900 of these rules. And the interesting one on why, on, uh, to show you why we really love consistency, I always love to show this one where you, um, where you have here 10 ways of checking whether a collection is empty. They're all slightly different. And instead of that, what we say is, please only use the isEmpty operator, such that it is a lot easier to understand the code. If you have to read this, it takes a, a bit longer than uh, reading something like, hey, it's empty. Uh, so this is the perfect example on like why we push this so much. And this is only one refaster rule, but you can imagine that if you have 900 of them, uh, your code base gets a lot cleaner and the most things get a lot easier to understand. So, <coughs> that's it for the error prone support part. Now we're going into the deep dive. And that will be interesting because first I will explain a few things and then we're going uh, to write a few, few refaster rules. Um, yeah, and that will be a fun part. So, um, first some background information on refaster, what are the goals, uh, how does it work, and then I want to show you some features that we are also going to use during this uh, demo. So, uh, as I mentioned, it's a tool built on top of error prone. So first, they were, two sep they were released as two separate tools, but Refaster really uses a lot of core features from error prone itself. So at some point they realized, hey, maybe it's better to combine them again. And now they are uh, both shipped uh, as one product, I would say. It started as a closed source thing, but then Google decided to, uh, to open source it in 2015. And it, uh, it's created by Louis uh, Wasserman. Um, so they open sourced Refaster as a tool itself, and there is this issue in uh, their GitHub repository dating from 2017 saying, hey, awesome tool, uh, I think you have a lot of Refaster rules internally because, well, you're Google, you uh, dedicated a lot of effort to it, you have a lot of code, and we probably have, we want to write the same rules to optimize the same things. And then they ask, can you open source that? Uh, and well, this was 2017, it's still open, they have never open sourced any of their refaster rules yet. Every year there's like a new message from someone saying, hey, it's a year later, can you already open source it, please? <laughs> uh, and to this day they, have done, uh, they haven't done it yet. So uh, that's also when we thought, okay, let's just start writing our own rules and open source it because, well, probably everyone can, can use the same ro uh, rules and there's quite some overlap in them. So yeah, um, some of the goals, the idea is that uh, refaster, that th when you write a refaster rule, it can easily run across a whole, uh, a very large code base and also be relatively fast. Because if it would take an, a large impact on your build time, yeah, you would simply not uh, like to run it uh, very often. Um, and the idea is that with a few annotations and uh, by using type arguments, which we will see, it's you can define a large battery of refaster rules and also a um, you're not very limited in the things that you can match and rewrite. The idea is that you can, um, as easy as possible, write a broad, uh, a wide variety of refast rules. That's the one of the goals. Um, yeah, and in which uh, cases can you use it? For example, if you want to use a simple, uh, if you want to rewrite, for for example, the optional dot get dot to dot or else throw, simple migration. But also, if you have a few uh, subsequent method calls, uh, like with the Fluent API, then you can also match part of those statements and rewrite those. And another one is the, um, if you have, for example, an if statement that we also saw during the demo, that's basic, that those are not expressions, but statements, and you can also match an if statement and then rewrite that to something. Um, yeah. And then about running refaster, I already briefly mentioned this. Uh, this is from the of official documentation website. Um, if you want to run refaster on one file, it simply looks like this. First, you have your refaster rule. You have right here the my rule dot refaster. What you uh, sorry, the string is empty. <laughs> is the, is the, is the refaster rule that you wrote, and then with this beautiful command you can create the my rule dot refaster, and that will then be used in the next step. And that's this uh, nice command where you use uh, my rule dot refaster, and then you say get that refaster rule, 
and apply it on demo.java. So this is the command to run one rule on one uh, simple clause. And then as, uh, since Java 17, you also need to add these exports because we're uh, working with some uh, internal compiler things that you need to uh, open up. So this is quite a lot of things that you need to do uh, in order to, to run it. Well, of course, we thought this is not usable. We have many classes, and we want to run a lot of refaster rules. So we basically made a refaster compiler and a, 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 yeah, the refaster rule compiler, which you can simply hook into your build, and it goes over all your code. It I tries to identify, hey, is this a refaster rule or not? Then it does that step for you, as in it creates the dot refaster rule for you, and then. Um, you can simply enable it like this, and with a name pattern, you can say, hey, uh, with it, it's basically a, regu a regular expression, and you can say, either run all refaster rules for me on all Java files, or uh, you can specify a subset with the regular expression. I would say it's magic, right? A lot easier to do. Um, yeah, so that's nice. And instead of being able to define only one refaster rule per file, we also made it uh, possible to simply nest this in, a, in basically a refaster rule collection. Uh, so we, what we have internally is that uh, we have collections per topic, so for example, string rules or um, Azure J rules or uh, even more specific. I already showed this a bit that we introduced the support for, um, for uh, showing the refaster rule um, emitted warnings, how do you say this? <laughs> such, that we, such that you could see these when you're uh, running a compilation. And this is how it would look like if you uh, apply this fix. Um, so now onto some of the, the more advanced features uh, that we're also going to use in the demo. So um, the first one is that we can have multiple before templates per refaster rule. So let's say uh, instead of having two, we can simply add another before template where we, in this case, are matching null equals object and object dot is null. And then both will be matched and rewritten to the content of the after template. But as you might have noticed, is that the, the, the signature of both of these methods are exactly the same because here we have Boolean um, and, and, and um, what is put, the parameters are also the same. So instead of having two separate before templates, what we can also do is that we have a one before template with a refaster dot any of. And then here we can list any kind of um, expression. You can imagine this is also used with the collection uh, is empty check that we uh, refaster rule that we had, but then it's uh, quite a large one. So still the same example with the, the null equals object and object dot is null, but a nice convenience feature that they uh, provide is that you can add this also negation annotation here. And it basically means that it introduces a copy of all the refaster rules that you have, but then it makes sure to uh, negate this and add an exclamation mark there. Oh wait, I have examples. <laughs> uh, and then it will basically match all these things. So in, in one go, you have like uh, four things that are being rewritten to, uh, to, to what you want in the after template. And you can also have some stylistic preferences. So for example, I mentioned, I showed you that we have this static import check, but you can also do this as part of a refaster rule. Um, so we are big fans of Azure J. Uh, so we have a lot of assert that in our code base, and we don't want to prefix everything with the assertions dot. Um, yeah, because it yeah, doesn't add a lot. So in that case, what we can add is we can add a simple annotation here saying, use this import policy uh, when you are rewriting code, and then we can either say that you want this, then uh, we have the import top level, but you can also say that we want to have the static import always, and that would mean that as a result, this will not be there and a static import will be added. Simple thing. And this is uh, similar to the if statement that I showed you. Uh, if we want to match a, a, yeah, a few statements, a block of code, then we can write a block template. Um, in this case, we see that we have a list with uh, two integers. Um, yeah, and when we are here, so here we are basically doing a swap, and then we can rewrite that to one simple statement. Uh, but please note that this is what um, what you sometimes write is like list.get0, uh, and you. Um, but 
how refaster works now is that we don't match on exact numbers, but again, this could also be a method call, like uh, you mentioned in the beginning, that if we do list.get and then a method call, ex as long as it is of type int, the resulting expression that we're putting in here. And uh, one of the most difficult ones is the, the placeholder annotation. And what this does is that we uh, can write a refaster rule, uh, but in that refaster rule, we can specify a placeholder, which will actually work like a placeholder, saying, hey, here I put a placeholder, which can mean zero or more expressions or, or statements, if you will. Uh, let me show you an example. Let's say we have an if statement here, and we uh, check if it contains the element, uh, not contains the element, and otherwise we add it. And here we have this placeholder that you see here at the top, which basically means try to match anything that looks like this. And here we can have either zero, one, or multiple um, statements in between. But still, you need to match it and rewrite it for me. Let me show you an example. On the right, we have, we have exactly this. Um, it, it matches the before template. And here we have something that uh, we have the log statement. Let me rephrase this a little bit. What we, what we say here is, uh, so again, this works as a placeholder, but it takes the signature that we define up here. So we say that we are looking for a placeholder that returns a void, so it doesn't return anything, and it can use the element that you're, that you're uh, using right here. And that's exactly what we see here. Um, so if this statement would not be here, we would match this, uh, this piece of code. But yeah, we basically say, hey, whatever you find here, as long as it matches this signature, we would uh, like to match it and then rewrite it to the, con to the content of the after template. OK, um, I have one more, and that's the argument types. Uh, w w what is cool about this is that you can, fairly, uh, you can fairly specifically specify which types in your code base you would like to match. So you can make it a very, uh, how do you say that? You can say, hey, I want to match all collections, but you can also say I want to match collections of type uh, that are using this specific type, for example. You can go, uh, you, can, you, you can do a lot of things here. Because if we would not use that, we could uh, end up with some non-compilable code. Because let's say we have a collection that we want to add things to, and we have the elements that we're going to add to this, uh, to this list. If they are not the same type or a subtype of this, then the result would basically not be correct, and we would have non-compilable code. So then we can say here at the top right, I have a line here. We can say uh, we have a collection of type T, and the elements that we want to add should be of type S, and therefore extend T. So then it will be compilable code. So now we're going to try uh, something new. Oh, that was another example. Uh, we're going to try something new. I'm not sure who's familiar with the Code With Me feature of IntelliJ, uh, but we're going to uh, do a few implement a few refaster rules, but I need the help of one very brave person for this. So what I would like to propose, if is there someone in the room who would like to try and code, code together with me uh, in IntelliJ? Uh, yeah, so that's, that's basically the question. Um, I'll let you think a bit about it, but uh, it would be very nice. You cannot make any mistakes. I will just guide you through, and uh, we will start very simple. We will start introducing, uh, writing a few refaster rules. I have some nice examples. I see someone getting his laptop there or not. Or okay, nice. We have a brave person. Okay, let's go. I will share uh, the um, uh, I will share the code with you. Uh -huh. Custom. Uh -huh. Okay. I will show like a shortened uh, URL for you, and then uh, so this is a new part that I'm going to try. So let's see uh, how it works. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. Oh. This will take a second to f to uh, to set up, but 
Can you uh, fill in this uh, URL? The bit.ly. And then I think it should be uh, ready to join me. If there is a second person who wants to join, that's also possible. It doesn't need to be only one. So what we're going to see, I'm going to take you through uh, through uh, two error prone support, and I have a workshop branch there that I sometimes use. And uh, we're going to uh, start. I'm going to do a very simple example of how to implement a refast rule, and then we're going to uh, well with the uh, all of us. We uh, we will do the typing, but you will also have to uh, bring your input on what to type, such that uh, we also make this session a bit more interactive. Otherwise, I do so much talking that it's uh, it would be maybe too much. So uh, I was going there. Accept the license agreement. That sounds about right. Oh, yeah, I need to accept. I think you're in. I will, uh, I will first uh, do the, the first one as an example, and then uh, we're going to type uh, together. Deal? Nice. OK. Uh, so I prepared five, uh, five assignments. And uh, how this works is that for uh, every refaster rule, we basically have an input file and an output file. And how this works is that uh, in the input file, you say what code should be matched in the before template. And then in the after template, we specify what the result would look like if we would apply the refaster rule on the input, if that makes sense. So I put uh, the input here on the left and the output here on the right. And here, the refaster. Oh, Ooh. One second. This one. So uh, what we're going to match here is we're going to Im implement the exact example that we saw a few times during the, the presentation. We have a foo dot uh, length equals uh, zero, and we have a foo uh, dot is empty on the right here, and that's basically what we want to match. So. First, we're going to write the before template and then the after template. Uh, <coughs> so we say before template, the return type, as we can see here, is that we have a Boolean. So here we would also have the return type Boolean. The method name that we pick here uh, doesn't really matter. Uh, but of course, we want to match uh, sorry, a string here. And then we say, hey, return uh, string dot length equals zero. Uh, IntelliJ already says, hey, this should be a dot is empty. So that's exactly what we're going to do. After, after template, boolean, after uh, string. I'm now going a bit fast, such that we can go to the next part. And then uh, we say string dot uh, is empty. And now if we run the test, it should be green. Let's hope for it. There are many tests, but there should be one green. The There's one pass, so that's nice. And one thing I want to show you is that, um, so uh, for example, the string, uh, what we can see here, is that the string class uh, implements the char sequence. So if we go back, what I want to show you is that uh, it doesn't only match like the the literal string, but if we would pass, if we would cause this to a string, it would still know that it should uh, rewrite that, uh, that it should still match that basically. And we now now it will pass because I didn't do it on the right side. But let me show you the output of the example. Uh, so what we see is that it was expected here on the right that we get a foo dot is empty, but I rewrote it, of course, to this, but it still rewrote it to dot, dot is empty. So it can see, hey, you're casting this, but it in the end is a string, so this should be fine. But if I am changing this to, uh, to this, we will see, will it match or will it not match? Any idea? Oh. Not match. Let's see. I was maybe we're too slow, but uh, we're here. Uh, and indeed, we see that it does not rewrite the two dot is empty because we say we match any string, but it's a char sequence, so it doesn't it doesn't work like that. But if we in the example here, 
say, let me, like this. Would it now match? I see nodding faces, indeed. Takes a bit of time. But now, indeed, we see that, uh, that it nicely matches as we expect. So um, that's it for the introduction on how to write a really faster rule. Uh, what's your name? Lucius? OK. Well, uh, are you ready? Let's see. <laughs> I will prepare the, the correct uh, examples. We have we have the first one that we put here. The input we put here, and the output we put here. Okay. So now I'm almost going to hand it over to you, and of course I will uh, I will help you where. Uh, where necessary, but the idea is that now we're going to, int uh, to introduce a rule that will uh, rewrite string dot copy value off to new string uh, with the same uh, with the uh, char array. Uh, so we have this one, and then the input is the char array, and then we have a new string with the char array. That's uh, that's what we want to do. So um, yeah. I would say if you uh, if you have any suggestions from the audience or if you already want to type something, I would say you can go ahead here. Um, please guide us. What uh, what should we do? Sorry, before rule, indeed. Nice. Let's start with the before one. Before template. Amazing. What is uh, what should we type first? Boolean string. Value a string, indeed. We should have a string. The name doesn't matter. Okay, um, then we want to, yeah, the char array. We want to match that, and then uh, the method body. Suggestions. Return string. Copy value off. Copy value off. Nice. That's nice. I don't need to do anything like this. <laughs> exactly. I think this uh, this looks quite nice. Good. You wrote your own uh, your first uh, before template. Nice. <laughs> okay. What's next? After template. Exactly. Quite easy, right? It's going really quite fast. Is the first one to try it out. Uh, it gets a bit a uh, bit harder uh, later. Okay, <laughs> let's see. Return new string. Indeed. Okay, moment of truth. Let's try. Yeah, I'm running uh, running them. Yes, and I see a green test. So it means that we wrote our before, uh, first before template. Nice, indeed. <laughs> Are you ready for the second one? Nice. Takes a bit of uh, switching between uh, presentation mode and uh, non-presentation mode, but okay. Uh, this one is a little bit harder. So what we see here is we see basically two things. Um, we have to write a really fast rule that matches collection dot singleton list with uh, an argument here, one, and uh, another one, but then with a string. So um, yeah, those, and then also the list dot off uh, with an int and a and a string, and we have to rewrite that all to one and the uh, same thing, and that's the immutable list dot off. And um, yeah, so what the uh, explanation says is implement this really fast rule, uh, preferably by using only one before template. Let's see. And the tip is use the uh, type argument. So that's what we see here. We have a, a, a T here. Um, so then the question is again, where what do we start with? Before template. Then we can try what should be the return type. This may be a bit harder question now. Sorry? 
the first, sorry, I didn't get it. The first. Read faster? You mean like the operator or? Oh, more ideas on, oh, yes? We could write a T extends collection. The T before. Um, yeah, um, let me think. What what is it? What is like the common theme here? If we look at the at the before templates, what what is uh, the one thing that what should we match? We should think about the parameters that go in the before template. That different, like we um, um, how to say this? Ah, we we can try some things. There are all lists. Yeah, let's let's go with that one. But uh, good uh, good suggestion. Keep uh, keep them coming. Uh, there are no wrong answers. Okay, we have a list before. I have to. Let me. One argument, yeah, sounds sounds good. Argument T input, yeah, yeah. Let's see. Okay, let's just maybe start with the first one. We just do a collection dot singleton list. Uh, let's make it a bit easier for ourselves. Now you can go on. You were. Uh, The any of uh, we can start with that. It's indeed uh, the read refaster dot any of. Nice uh, suggestion already. What do we write in the any of suggestions? Some somewhat louder. Does someone have uh, an idea? Again, no wrong uh, answer. So please just shout. Collection collection dot singleton list oh, uh, of input. Indeed, nice. Oh, we can already do the comma, maybe, indeed. Good one. Oh, return as well. Yeah, good one. And then we can, yeah, indeed, put the comma. And then list.off, input. I'm repeating the answers such that everyone can hear them. Um, yeah. Okay, we can go on, I think. We have a bit longer, so uh, we'll be fine. <laughs> um, yeah, we can, uh, I think for before template looks nice. After template. Come again? Oh, can I scroll down? <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> I was like, why, why doesn't he go down? But uh, it was me, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> List after template, the input looks good. So now we look to the right. What do we want to have? I hear immutable, immutable. Immutable list out of input. Okay. We need another generic type because it's not the same as the input, you say? S extends T. Mm, let's see. Let's see what. Uh, oh, the second one is already good. Uh, so it is. Uh, but then the question might be, why is it? Uh, why is it correct then? Uh, because we say we we put in a string. Um, so why does it match? Is that kind of the question? Or what's the why? Because the the thing is, is that what we uh, say here, when we are going, we say, when we're going to analyze the code, we um, are going in in this piece of so we're going over this piece of code. And refaster is only going in between uh, in in expressions and statements, which means inside things inside method bodies. Um, so what it does, it tries to see everything that matches type uh, like T, which is of type T. It will try to match here. And all these things are of type T because it's a generic type argument. So it will put, it will see, hey, I have a one here. What if I put one in here? Can I find a match? Well, uh, do you have any of these expressions? Well, I have a collection dot singleton list of one, and that is input. So yes, I have a match here. And then it will continue with the string. 
So any um, anything of type T will uh, will be matched in the before template. So that's why we match also the string and the integer. Does it make sense? List object, yeah, because here we it will see, okay, uh, the t you're putting in here is an integer. So now t will be an integer, and then it will know that this should also return that type, because it will it will uh, infer that. So that's how, how we know that uh, either if we have string or integer here, that it will return the same correct uh, type here. Okay, uh, nice. That was the, the second one. You don't have. Mm, you don't have a distinction between the primitives. Um, yeah, there's some auto boxing going on uh, by um, by read faster uh, out of the box. So it will, if you say I want to match double, it will match both, indeed. Um, if you, yeah, so th the thing is like deep I I inside a uh, read faster, there is this, this um, Boolean that says, hey, can I uh, auto box uh, them? And that is always uh, untrue. So you cannot say I want to match only this, but what you might be able to do, well, what you can do is something that I'm not going to show you today, but that you can write a matcher, uh, that is uh, matches, and then you can give here, um, yeah, like a, a class name, uh, with a pr primitive uh, thing, print class, and then you can write an implementation that says, "Hey, whenever you are trying to do this, do I match?" Um, yeah, the logic that you write here, and then you can say, "Hey, is this actually correct? Uh, am I actually matching this specific type?" And then you you could solve it like that, or you could uh, create a PR in uh, in Google Error Prone, and they would probably accept it uh, to override this value. Yeah. Ah, so yeah, I can imagine. So we want to get rid of bad examples in our own code base. So we have to write ugly rules to match these things. Uh, yeah, but we have quite some of these things in uh, in our code base. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Nice. Uh, let's go on to the next one. Like this. This is a bit the harder one, a block template that we talked about. Uh, that we are kind of doing two at the same time. Um, because, yeah, that's nice. <laughs> um, it looks similar to what we already have seen before. Uh, so we have the if statement with uh, a condition here. And if it's matched, then we throw a new illegal argument exception. But instead, we would like to have the check argument one. Now the question is, how uh, would that look like if we start implementing this in our code base, uh, in our refast rule? Any suggestions how we should start? At before template, a uh, good one. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Void, interesting, yeah, because we're not, yeah, we want to match a statement, so not return anything. Good one as well. Oh, should I already scroll? Before template, void before. A Boolean, maybe. Um, oh, yeah, indeed, because, well, the structure is that we want to match this food all this empty which re yeah, returns a boolean and I on, uh, on purpose here put a, a different expression here because we want to match something that returns a boolean. So indeed that's the, the parameter of the, the before template, good one. Condition, okay, then we can uh, write something that looks very similar to the, if the, to the example above.
Yeah, throw a new log illegal argument exception. And then we can write, well, I will say this time we can write off the template. <laughs> and then how would that look? Sorry? Um, sorry, you're looking at this one, or what do you mean? We can, yeah, both match. Yeah, that's that's the goal. We uh, I showed here two examples to, uh, otherwise we would might yeah, um, um, now yeah. So the idea is that indeed that both of these uh, would match. So we have check argument with the same boolean expression. Should I import or uh, it doesn't work? All, uh, oh, check argument. Yes, indeed, the S. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Looks already quite good. Now, because it's a large diff, it will look, and we have implemented only one of the two rules, the diff will be a bit weird. Um, but I will still show you. And the third one. So first it says, hey, this is what you expect, only like check argument, check argument. But this is what it what I found. Well, we have the preconditions dot check argument, so they are matching, though we have the preconditions in front, so not yet exactly. And then we have still have to implement the second one. So that's what we so there are two things that we need to do. Um Static import, indeed. Um, I will uh, give away the, the exact name. It's like uh, we can add an import policy. Uh, so there's an annotation. Uh, sorry, the, the name of the import of the annotation is use import policy. <laughs> exactly. And then import policy. Which one? There are, oh wait, maybe I can show the, uh, sorry, import policy. I, uh, I can show it. <laughs> Static import, bam. Exactly. Now we could run it again and see if it had any effect. Let's see. Ah, so, okay. So now, uh, again, the diff is a bit weird because we didn't implement the second one yet, but there are no changes about the first one, so it's correct now. So indeed, we fixed the preconditions. So now we can do the second one, which is almost exactly the same. So I suggest maybe we can copy it. Um, but then there is a slightly sli uh, a small difference, and that is the string that we are passing here. It's a bit of a large uh, example. Um, but yeah, now we also need we also want to match those cases. So I see already some copying going on here. Um, you're doing well. <laughs> Ooh, interesting one. Um, so now we're writing another before template. While uh, there's, we in both cases want to do something slightly different um, because they have some overlap, but we want to do something different. So uh, we should actually have two before templates in this case. Uh, sorry, two read faster rules. So this is. Might be you could consider this a limitation be of refast because yeah the templates are very similar but yeah we want to do something slightly different so we can't use both of uh, we can't define them in one refast rule it's a bit of uh, sometimes you uh, we have these cases internally that you have a few quite a few of these variations and then uh, well let's say you have ten refast rules that are almost similar sometimes it's then easier to write an error prone check because then it's a bit easier to do it. So it's sometimes a bit of a trade-off. Okay, what's the state? I think it's uh, without message, with message. Nice, before template. Oh, okay, look at this. This is already going well. Uh, so we have, uh, what you do is, come again? Message is not used, indeed, almost perfect. Yes, and then in the after template we have it. Let's see what it does right now. I remove the enter so that it fits on one screen. Uh, let's see. Are we doing on time? Um, yeah, uh, looks good. I'm thinking with respect of to 
time. I think we should skip the fourth one. Uh, and then we can go on with the harder one. Okay. So, again, this is a slightly uh, harder one, but I think uh, together we will get through it. You already uh, provided a lot of nice answers. So, um, what we're seeing here is um, we have to implement a really fast rule uh, by using oh, the placeholder annotation. So, what we see is that we have a stream.off. Uh, this, of course, can be also a variable. And then we have the non match uh, with something in here that, uh, that we would like to match. Um, and then we would like to rewrite that because if, if we have a non-match with uh, an exclamation mark, it basically means all match of the negation. Um, so uh, it may, may seem daunting, but uh, we will take it uh, step by step and we will uh, get through it. Um, so yeah, I would say uh, take it away. Um, of course, first we need a before template. Let's start with the structure of it. Any suggestions? Sorry? Boolean? Yeah. Before. Then what do we want to have? Stream? Yeah, good one. Um, ooh, of what type? String. Oh, good one. I uh, forgot to add an example here such that we do not do not only have strings. So let's say, what would we do if we also have an, uh, uh, have an integer? How can we make it generic? Ah, the answer is on the screen. <laughs> nice. No, good. good. Indeed, uh, import the stream. Amazing. So we have a stream. And yeah, what do we, are we going to write? We have a Boolean that we have to return, but uh, that can in we have the non-match. Now almost comes the difficult part. We have indeed uh, something, and then uh, we are using. So we do not want to match exactly on uh, as uh, i dot blank, for example, because we also have starts with. So this is an example of where we can use such a placeholder. We can say, hey, we want to match something after the negation that is, a yeah, and we don't know the exact structure. So um, indeed, uh, we what we could do is uh, maybe first start with uh, adding the placeholder on top uh, within the class should be abstract. And then we have to say we can determine the... So now we're going to write an abstract method. And the idea is that we have to provide the signature of this placeholder. So if we look at the code, we see that we have an exclamation mark, and then we have to add the placeholder. In this case, s dot is blank. Well, what is the signature of that expression? Boolean, indeed. So we have uh, a placeholder. Uh, uh, yeah, Boolean condition. Yeah, um, so we... Um, Boolean should be on the next line, uh, and then uh, we do not. Uh, we um, are defining uh, a method here. Um, that's how it uh, how it should be. Boolean condition t input. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, oh, and um, because it's a method, and uh, this is a bit of refaster magic. So because it's we have to define it like this, it should be if we check the error. I think it will say, hey, please make it abstract or something. Or declare abstract. So indeed, we uh, make it abstract now. So this is basically how we define a, a placeholder. Nice. Together, we'll get there. So the idea is uh, that we s now have something that says, hey, I might take an input, um, and uh, it I will return a Boolean. And we already have a method name, so we can now use that in the exact same place that you're now. And then, indeed, we take the i. And then if we put a yeah, semicolon there, and indeed a return, amazing, good, uh, good one. Then I think we wrote something very nice. We, uh, we wrote the, the before template plus placeholder, so we're doing well. Um, and then um, we can write uh, the after template. Boolean. Again, the stream as an input. Amazing. Stream. 
Um, and the cool thing is, with this placeholder, we simply do not care about anything that uh, that will be put there. We will match all of these uh, expressions. And with a few um, a few nice refaster rules like this, we can uh, sig significantly, uh, yeah, well, lower the complexity of mo of some of these uh, statements that we have in our code base. So, uh, let me run the tests because this looks uh, very nice. Let's see if it's green. Fifth. Indeed, it's green. So, nice. We did it. Um, I have something for you. I want to uh, get a, give him a hand because he uh, did a very nice job. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> nice. And that's all in time. I saw a question there. Yes. Uh, come again. Can you talk a little bit louder? What happened if Sorry, I don't fully get the uh, get it. <laughs> yeah. So if it's not uh, s dot is blank but w if it would be what? Sorry. The first rule, yeah. Yeah, string dot length equals zero. Yeah, that's the one. So you you mean the the, the first example in this example, or do you, would you mean the placeholder in the first example? If there are two rules matching the same thing, you mean? In the same line of code. Good question. Um, what happens if there are two lines matching something in the same bit of code? Well, um, yeah, so we wrote a bit of our own refaster implementation uh, with uh, w that I showed you uh, during um, in the beginning. And uh, what we did there is because, of course, yeah, we sometimes have did that have this uh, specific thing that that there are some overlapping changes. And what we we have some simple logic right now saying, hey, please take the the, the biggest uh, replacement of them and apply that one, and don't apply the other one. So then, in a in a in a uh, let's say this this rewi rewrites a, a quite a big statement, and the other one, if it would only be a si small part, uh, it would first do the big one, and then if you run it again, it would do the small one. That's how we do it. Good question. Um, other questions in between? Uh, yes. Does it always have to be an abstract class or could it be an interface? Um, um, yeah, placeholders have to be defined like this, so it indeed cannot be uh, interface. That's just how uh, Refaster made this. Yeah, but uh, this is so Refaster is just a DSL with wi that you use to define this, and yeah, they they chose for abstract uh, just uh, implementation detail. Yeah. That we create created our own bugs, or what do you mean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ah. So if we whether, sorry, the last part. Uh, so the question is, if we introduce bugs ourselves by creating these refaster rules or checks? Um, the, the good answer is, I don't know, <laughs> could, could be. It's like it's supplied within a uh, whole picnic, so the chance that something is introduced that is in that specific case wrong, that can of course happen, but I would say it's very extensively tested because all the checks and bugs, uh, bug checks that you write are applied on all picnics Java, and also because it's open source, even uh, it can also be applied outside of Picnic. So we really have to think about all the specific use cases and Im edge cases and everything. So writing a check is definitely not easy. So we try to guard against introducing bugs, of course. Uh, but yeah, I cannot say, no, it never happened. There is always an edge case and then um, yeah, someone will, will, will see that. And yeah, I will show you how we use it within Picnic and uh, yeah, we will, I will show you how we can, will not introduce that.
Ja. Um, we, we will get uh, to, to those things. I will, uh, uh, because we're short, well, otherwise we'll get short on time and now uh, we'll move on and we will do uh, questions later on. So, uh, sorry, I, uh, otherwise we uh, have problems with the time. A quick one, okay, then it can be. Uh, what, a Maven plugin, yeah? Yes. Um, and in the end, I will show a QR code uh, to our GitHub project, and there is also a Gradle, uh, Gradle plugin uh, example and link. So, yeah, good question. Okay, well, uh, thanks for the participation. I hope you like this, uh, this way of uh, writing the read fast rules. Uh, it was also new for me. Uh, now the error prone deep dive uh, will be a bit smaller. Um, so, uh, yeah, let's dive right in. Uh, Refaster was actually the first tool uh, of the Refaster and AirProne tool uh, to be created. So in 2012 they open sourced this, and the whole goal of this was to make sure that the code to help out with the code reviews and uh, make sure that also the quality of the unit tests are uh, and other code are uh, yeah, uh, that they are bug free and that you guard against um, often occurring problems. And one of the interesting details is that this AirProne itself is written against a very internal um, uh, part of the a, uh, of the compiler, I must say. So what they have in uh, I think I have an image of that. Yes. Uh, so if you're writing checks yourself, you might see this Java doc where it says, "Hey, you're now building something against something that is not part of any supported API." So you, yeah, there there can be changes that can break some of your code uh, later on when there are new versions of the JDK or whatever. Um, so yeah, because. I, I, AirProne is really powerful, but in order to get that power, they had to uh, build something against a lot of the internals of the of the compiler. But uh, I would say the the support they they uh, provide is is very nice. And once there are new early access uh, JDKs, they make sure that if there is a bug, they fix it. And support has been good for many many years. And uh, also n n interesting to notice about error-prone is that it works on a compilation unit level, which means that it can do an analysis per source file. So it cannot see, hey, where is this specific method used throughout your code base? It only builds a model of the class that you have, uh, that you're analyzing. But then it knows, it, it does know about, like, uh, if you're extending something, it, it knows a lot about the context, but not, it cannot build your whole code base, like a an, an tree of your whole code base. So I want to dive a little bit into how this works and how AirProne can do its analysis. Uh, in the beginning, I briefly mentioned abstract syntax trees, uh, and I'm going to show you a, a bit how, how this works and how AirProne um, does, its, does its analysis. So we start with a very simple Java class. has only two methods, uh, very simple. One has a return method, a uh, return uh, statement, and the other doesn't. What AirProne does, or all compilers basically, is they are going to build an abstract tree representation of your code. And this is a very simplified one, but the idea is that error prone will, uh, b uh, the compiler builds this and error prone will do, will use the visitor pattern to go over your code. So what it will do, it starts at the top, it sees, hey, you have a class, then it uh, will go into the method, it sees, hey, you're a method, it can do an analysis there, oh, you have a return statement, and it go back, and then it will go to the second one. But the cool thing is that on every of this, uh, every of these, uh, each of these nodes, you have a lot of information available about that node. So for example, on a method node, those are method nodes, you, uh, and they're called a tree, and the idea is that of every node, there's, for example, this uh, this kind of information. So you know what modifiers does it have? Is it public, static? Uh, what is the name, return type? What parameters? Uh, do I have a body? All these things. So if I want to, for example, create a check that uh, that sees that that deletes empty methods. So for example, this one. What you would write? What you would write is that you would have a a, a matcher that says, "Hey, when you are visiting your tree and you see a method tree, I want to do something and I want to see if the, uh, the body of the method, if, if, if it is there or not. And if it's not there, you simply say in this case, hey, oh, this doesn't have a body, so please remove the whole uh, method body. Um, that's a simple example. Now I want to show you a, 
this requires some introduction. Uh, <laughs> I want to show you a slightly larger tree, still of a very simple class, and I want to take you a bit through how this analysis would go. But mind you, this is again a simplified version of the code you're seeing here. So just to give you an idea of how you would traverse this and basically show you that it can be quite complex quite quickly, because again, this is a fairly small class. So what you would do when you're visiting is you start at the compilation unit level, which basically means your whole source file. Then the next step would be that you go into the class definition, you have the class tree, and a class has members, can be imports, uh, can be uh, fields, methods, well, this only has a method, and you go into the method tree, a method tree uh, has a block, the, the method body itself, and a method body, again, has multiple statements. And the first statement is uh, just a simple variable tree, which consists of two expressions, and uh, on the other side, when we go up, we go back again, and we see that there's another statement. And that's a return statement, and a return statement has a binary tree. Uh, and then we have two, one identifier and one literal tree. So again, this is even a simplified version. So you can imagine that there are quite some things to analyze. Um, but the interesting thing about error prone is I mentioned that it, it, it can, it, I showed you that it provides these suggested fixes, so it knows about your code. But what is interesting is that this, uh, th this is the example I showed you, but this is the same class, but like I renamed some stuff, added some uh, comments. But the cool thing is that this, th this results in exactly the same tree and the same way of traversing. But error prone, when once it finds something, it just knows, hey, here you have some uh, comments that I need to maintain. Here you have a an empty line. It knows about these things such that it can give you a good suggestion for a replacement. Um, yeah, um, we're also going to briefly uh, introduce a new bug checker exactly for this case uh, to show you a bit uh, about wh wh which things you need to think when implementing a bug checker. So this is uh, the, yeah, the, the bare minimum that you ha uh, need to have for a bug checker. The idea is that you have an outer surface annotation, uh, a bug pattern annotation where you can have some information on, this, uh, on the bug pattern itself. And then uh, comes the important part where you have an example check which extends bug checker. And there we say, hey, I implement a method invocation tree matcher. It's a long word, but what that means is that when error prone is traversing your code and you see a method invocation or a method tree, could be anything that you want to listen to, then it will go into this method. It says, hey, I matched a method invocation. And then it gives you the tree that it is currently matching when it's traversing your whole code. And then you can do an analysis, like is it empty, is it not empty, all these things. Oh, um, I'm switch, skipping this one. Um, oh wait, uh, what I want to add about this is that uh, while error prone can provide suggested fixes for you, in some cases writing a fix can be really hard. So you can also only flag specific things and, and point out that it is a problem, but not provide a fix. So for example, we have a check that flags nested optionals. Well, in, uh, if you have a legacy code base, you can find some really weird nested optionals with, uh, yeah, with quite a lot of code, which yeah, you cannot simply guard against, and you will only uh, show an error and not be able to fix it. But on the other hand, you can also have uh, quite some large uh, fixes. Uh, so we have quite some rules around the uh, JUnit and, uh, and how to use that. Uh, what, what you see here is a combination of, just to give you an idea of what, 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 the, what you can do with it, but you can say, what, what we do is um, we have an argument with false, true, and uh, another uh, Boolean, uh, and we have a whole method source. Uh, it's a bit specific maybe, but the idea is that instead of the, the red code, we can also have the green code, which is a lot less code, and we... Uh, prefer that. So once we determined we can do this rewrite, what you can say is, hey, add an import statement for this specific thing, replace this method source annotation with this annotation, and please delete this method. So you can do quite a lot of things once you're using error prone. It's quite powerful and can do many, many rewrites. Now, an, a simple overview, because I talked a lot about both of these tools, but wha when to use wi which. Um, so let's say that refaster itself is mostly for doing the, the, the more or less simple, simple things. 
Uh, but on the other hand, you also have limited expressiveness. What, you, what I just showed you with error prone, you can do very large rewrites, but also fairly complicated uh, checks. And well, refast is mostly for refactoring only. While, as I just mentioned, error prone can also um, also only flag things in your code base. Then I think I have enough time to show you a little bit uh, how you would go about implementing this uh, empty method check. Um, and again, I of course need your your input for that. Um, yeah, need to change some things. We have this one. And this one. Okay. Okay. Mm, let me think. So I prepared a few uh, simple checks. Um, it's a bit uh, besides each other, it's not ideal, but then you can at least see the full overview. So what I created is an auto service. Uh, well, I just did the setup here. And then what I said is that we want to implement a method tree matcher. And we're going to uh, write something that says, hey, please traverse the code. Once you see a method, let me do some logic to check if something is empty, uh, whether there are statements or not. And otherwise, remove it or don't do anything. And on the right, you see the, the test classes that we have. It's a bit of a weird way of writing the code, but I won't uh, get into the details about why that is. But what you see is that we have a simple example, uh, which yeah, is, is not an empty method, so we don't want to do anything with that. Also not an empty method. And then here, we have an empty method, and then you see bug diagnostic contains, which means we should have a match here. Um, and we also have replacements. That's also interesting, where we first have an Example with two empty methods and one non-empty method, and we should end up with only one method once we sort of first we have the input, we run the ref the error prone check, and then the result of that. So um, I showed you the, the all the information that we have about a method on the slide, but let me show you again. What this means is um, we match the method, we are seeing a method, and you get past the method here. And a method tree, if I click on this, oh, if I click on this, we have all this information about the method itself. So we have the modifiers, again, that I showed you. And we also have uh, the get rows, get body, default value. So um, yeah, it's maybe a bit uh, quick, uh, and we, we don't have, have a lot of time. So. What are your opinions? What do you think that we should uh, check now in order to determine whether it's an empty method or not? Get body. That's a good one. Let's see. We have the tree, and we have a get body, which returns a block tree. Well, maybe. Sorry. Check if it's check if it's empty. Uh, l let's see what a block tree is. A block tree. Uh, yeah. We cannot check it, it's, uh, whether itself is empty. It has, it has the information about is static, or it has statements. Check if statements oh, statements is empty. If uh, le let's let's do it the other way around. If it's not empty, then we return simply description no match. Mm -hmm. Oh, is empty. Let's see what it says. Oh, this is the wrong test. Come again? There is no tree objects. So what do we need to write then, or what? Um, it's running in the background, I believe. This, uh, so now we have twice to no match, but first we need to exclude some things, and then we are going to. Uh, we can also write the suggested fix already to see. Um, so we want to provide a, a fix where we say, okay, if we have a match and we know it's not empty, we want to delete it. So I will give this away because it's a bit specific. Uh, but what we say, we are going to describe a match where we match this tree, 
And then we have, a su I showed you the suggested fix API. And what we would like to say is let's see what kind of things this has. Uh, we can swap some things, replace some things with literal um, characters. Yeah, it's a bit it's a, it's at the top, so it's <laughs> it already gives it away. But let's say we, we are going to use the, the, the delete one, and we can provide the tree here. Um, does it run? No, yeah, it runs. Ah, it says cannot invoke get statements. I think you might mention did mention that in the beginning. Ah. OK, the replacement already works. That's nice. Um, and here we have a case where we say cannot, cannot invoke get statements because the return value of get body is null. So what do we do? Check on modifiers. Um, OK, why would we check modifiers? Um, yeah, but right now it's complaining about the tree that the get body is is, is no. Sorry. If it's abstract, uh, it would be no indeed. And do we want to delete those or not? I don't know. Well, would you, if you're analyzing the code and you find an abstract method, would we remove it? Uh, that's a definite. That's a. It's a good question. It's like. We need to think about all the kind of things that we can match, and well, in general, if you think, okay, we have an uh, we have an uh, an abstract uh, class, we have a method in there, it is indeed empty, but yeah, what what would happen if we drop that? Problem, indeed, <laughs> because the code will probably not compile, so we would like to exclude those from this check because otherwise it would be way too risky. So uh, let's say we s we establish that if the body uh, is null. Then we know it's an abstract one, so uh, we don't want to match. But then we have the same problem uh, in uh, because of the time. I'm I'm going to uh, type it a bit faster. Um, get body is not no. I think like this. Oh. Mm -hmm. So if it's an abstract one, we don't want to do anything. Uh, but if there are, and if there are statements, it also means we don't want to drop the method body. Uh, let's see what it says right now. Uh, saw unexpected error on line three. Uh, that is, it's a bit finicky to read. But here we have another. Ooh, it's a bit small now. Mm. Sorry, on line uh, so file B on line three, which is this one. We are overriding uh, a method, and it's but it's empty. Is this something we could drop or not? No, indeed, because the code would not compile. So we need to add another thing, um, and this is also a bit specific. So I will give it away. Uh, so yeah. So we want to prevent it if it's uh, if it's annotated with with something. So we can say, hey, uh, there's this nice method that we can use. AST helpers, uh, it, you can basically say, hey, if I provide this tree, does it have java.long.override? And then we need to pass in the state. Um, so we say, went a bit fast, if AST helpers, if this tree has an annotation called java long override, then uh, we don't want to match, basically. Let's see what it does right now. Um, yeah, so uh, what he rightfully noticed is that uh, it's null if this is an abstract or native method. And we don't want to throw away, uh, oh, you mean like because it's now already fixed if we drop it. Yeah, OK, uh, good one. Uh, we, we could check that. But um, right now we have a green test, so, uh, so I'm happy. <laughs> uh, if we would have more time, we would dive into that. But um, so it was a very, very quick one. But we implemented also our first bug pattern, so that's really nice. Now on to uh, some of the last uh, slides. Okay, uh, because now I showed you a lot about error prone, and you know how, how to use it, when to use it, when to use which. 
but I also want to give you some information on how you can actually start implementing it in your own code base. Um, because this is quite, quite an, uh, a difficult process because, for example, if you would introduce error prone and you would enable all the 500 bug patterns on your large code base or your legacy code base, you would get so many changes that simply it would not work and yeah, there are way too many changes. No one would want to review that, let alone even deploy that. So uh, I made a, a simple roadmap where uh, the, the goal is to introduce error prone in your code base, but you disable all checks. And the idea is that you have this iterative process where you start with enabling one error prone check, run it on your code base and, and pick pick one rule that if that you know that if someone would see the changes, he would say, he or she would say, this is really nice. This has caught a bug for me that I would otherwise not have fixed. And then you ask for some reviews. They uh, show you the result. Uh, sorry, you ask for some reviews, you merge it, and then you do this again. You pick another bug pattern that, ha that, th that has some good fixes, and you make sure that also the others get really enthusiastic about the, the, the checks that you are introducing. Because they, you can say, hey, I want to push error prone, and I want to push all this automated analysis. But if they are like, yeah, you're pushing way too many things, I'm not agreeing with this, they would say, they would push back, not review your PRs, and it would simply not get into your code base. So we need to prevent that and need to make sure uh, that we uh, that we tread uh, smartly here, uh, yeah, tread lightly, make, make smart moves about which ones we want to introduce. Then we uh, iter iteratively do this till we are at the point that we enabled all uh, error uh, bug patterns. Quick question? Can we enable this only for the new code? Uh, no, we cannot, sadly enough. It just uh, it, yeah, doesn't make a distinction between that. It will just analyze all the code. But good question. But yeah, you can simply say, hey, I only want to show a warning and, uh, and do not fill the build over this. And then it will still show you the errors or like this, the, the warnings in your, in your um, the, uh, via text in, in your compiler, but not fill the build. So that's, that's how you could still use it. Can you analyze the file modification date? <laughs> I would have to check the implementation of the comp uh, compilation unit thing, but I don't think so, to be honest. Um, one quick question, then I go on. If you could use an annotation or something to ignore uh, specific checks, yeah, you can use the suppress warning mechanism to say, hey, I don't want to you to touch this. And you could introduce it like that. I think they also do it like that at Google. Um, but yeah, then you have a lot of suppressions or like, yeah, th also not, not uh, ideal. Um, so I, um, what I did is I, to show you how, how it works uh, when you want to enable a specific bug pattern, I uh, took an open source repository and I applied one uh, rule there. And uh, what I want to show you is that one, uh, if you apply a rule, this is the unnecessary final bug pattern. I have a simple command to just, uh, to just run that. Sorry. Uh, but what I want to show you is it takes a while to get larger. That if you enable one specific bug pattern on your code base and you are um, checking all, the reviewing all these changes. The changes are so similar that it is really easy to uh, to analyze them because I know, okay, this is the unnecessary final one, and at some point you know, okay, this is this looks good, and you can simply pattern match all the changes. So if you enable specific bug patterns per PR, it's also a lot easier for your colleagues to review these things. That's why I say that you have to do them per uh, per check, basically. Um, so yeah, um, yeah. Now on to how we use it within Picnic. Um, so the thing is, we have over seventy different Java repositories, and all these repositories have one common parent. And in, in this parent, we maintain the configuration for static analysis tools or other shared libraries that we have, such that they are all used the same throughout whole Picnic. And what we also have is a patch script that you can simply run on your code. Uh, well, if you invoke that patch script, it will just run a build, use the two Maven profiles we saw at the beginning, it will add error prone, it will add the patch mode. And then uh, the idea is that there are, of all the checks that we use, because we uh, automatically fix them, there are no violations. So if you write some code, 
and you forgot to fix some of these error prone uh, violations. Uh, and um, what would happen is you said, okay, I wrote some code, I create a, a pull request, and let the CI uh, check check it if it's uh, if it's valid and uh, all the tests are still green. But let's say you forgot to run patch. What it will do is it will say, hey, uh, there is there is a violation of one of your error pro of well one of the error prone checks. Please run the patch script uh, locally as a as a developer. It means you need to check out the the branch again, you run the patch script and you inspect the changes. And this is a conscious decision because if we would simply say, hey, there is a violation of an error prone rule and we would automatically run the patch script for you, it would mean that yeah, we would have automated changes committed to, to this branch and that's something we do not want because there might be edge cases where, where you might want to exclude this specific uh, violation, for example. And it's really important that the developer stays in control of what is happening. But if there is only a suggestion or a warning, because of these flags, the build will simply fail and you cannot merge, which means that as a result of that, all um, there, there are no of zero of these violations in our code base anymore. So you do not need to think about any of them anymore, especially not during code review, which is a very nice thing. Um, and we ha I told you that we already applied all these 500 error prone checks, but at some point we had this uh, open error prone support uh, repository. We had many rules there, but we didn't apply them yet on all Picnic Java code. And then uh, after I joined, uh, uh, after my thesis, I could actually work on this. And what I did is I created uh, more than 60 pull requests across, well, back then, uh, 40, 40, 50 different repositories, and I uh, applied all these refast rules. And then the goal was to check, are all these 900 rules, are they correct? Are they, are they something that we actually want to use? Uh, do the developers like them instead of saying, hey, here are developers, this is now how you have to write code. We wanted to be sure that they were, were really on board with all the changes that we wanted to introduce. So therefore, we took this effort of going through all the repositories, apply all the changes, and make sure we could get feedback from all the developers to see if they actually liked what we were proposing. So you might still wonder, okay, how would the developer go about that if I would uh, create such a PR and ask for a review? Well, what we did is we set it up in such a way that uh, per, per topic, so per refaster rule collection, we made a commit, and, that, and then we asked the developers to literally go over all the changes per commit, such that what I showed you, if you're scrolling and, uh, and you're going over the code changes, that they are really similar and quite easy to review, because otherwise, it would be simply way too many changes from all kinds of different libraries, whatever. Um, and they really liked this approach, and they also really liked it that, that we took into account their opinion, because sometimes, we did this in many repos, sometimes we saw that there were some developers giving some pushback on some of the changes. They said, huh, is this really something we want to automate? Is it, is it actually a good change or not? And then when, once we saw that multiple teams were giving some pushback, we said, okay, uh, good point. We, there, there are multiple people not really agreeing to this. We should solve this instead of saying this is now how you have to do it. What we did is we created a Slack polls and we said, hey, this is what we want to do. In this case, we have three ways of writing one and the same thing. Local time dot off, zero, zero, local time midnight, whatever. So there are three ways of writing one and the same thing. Is this something we should automate and enforce one over the other? Um, or should we not do anything with it? Well, what you usually see, some people are quite opinionated about this and think we should use one over the other because it's a lot better or we should not touch this. Um, but what you saw in general is that most developers are like, hey, I don't really matter which one of the three it is. I want, to make sure, want you to make sure that, uh, that you ensure that only one can be used and that all the others are automatically migrated such that I don't need to think about it again. And I never have to write a comment about, hey, we agreed on using this one instead of the other one. So we could use quite some consensus, if you ca as you can see here, for example, and we have m more examples of this. And again, the fact that we asked them for their input made them really happy and yeah, make us enabled us to go all in with these kind of changes. So then what is the current state of error prone support? Uh, because what I told you in the beginning is that the goal was really to minimize the repetitive, repetitive discussions that were happening on, on trivial, non-urgent uh, or non-important things. So 
once we had this setup, we would we wanted other developers to come with their ideas that they were doing a code review and thought literally that, hey, why am I writing a comment about this again? We can simply automate it, and not only in my repository, but also for everyone within Picnic. Well, we needed to make them enthusiastic about providing, of, uh, coming with their ideas and contributing their ideas to error prone support. So then we thought, okay, how are we going to incentivize all these developers to, to come with their ideas and actually bring them? So we used a really powerful mechanism for this, and that is uh, custom stickers. So we said, hey, once you have a contribution or once you have five contributions, you get the shiny one. Well, uh, that worked uh, very well, and uh, that even more contributed to the fact of them feeling a part of this and being really welcome to these changes. Because now every month there is an upgrade of our parent, and everyone just runs the script once, and they get like a lot of code improvements out of the box, and they don't, they don't need to do anything about it. So we had over 50 contributors already in, uh, in, uh, within Picnic, also some external adopt, uh, adoption and uh, contributions, so that's quite cool. Um, for example, CheckStyle, I showed you that in the beginning, is also uh, using uh, error-prone support. And I'm now even talking with someone from the OpenJDK who wants to uh, use our testNG to JUnit migration on the OpenJDK. So that's also quite a big compliment. So that's going quite well. Then uh, another example of that is uh, Open Rewrite. Um, usually I get the question afterwards, do you know Open Rewrite? Uh, because it's also a large-scale uh, large refactoring tool that can do even larger migrations like Spring Boot 2 to Spring Boot 3, uh, which we also use internally. But they really liked our uh, refast rules, and they said, yo, we're going to build a bridge between your refaster rules, or error prones refaster, and our platform, such that uh, with one, uh, the cool thing is that with they index your full repository, and with a few clicks, you can actually run our refaster rules on open source repositories, or if you use their commercial license, also on your own repositories. But um, yeah, it's quite cool that they also build this integration. So to, uh, to summarize on uh, about two perspectives uh, of the developers and the, and the people who are maintaining these configurations. Um, the approach that we used and the way in which we set, the, we set this up uh, yeah, just resulted in very happy developers that are getting an ever more uh, consistent and higher quality code base, and they can uh, be a part of that too. Um, so they really like it, but uh, we really learned that you have to make sure that you need to think twice about the, the, the things that you are introducing, because go pushing too much can cause this pushback, and you really, especially in the beginning, need really need to think about what am I doing, and uh, is everyone agreeing with this? Um, yeah, uh, so I'm, I did a lot of talking about error prone, but I actually also work for a, for a company. I work for uh, Picnic. It's an uh, it's an online supermarket based in the Netherlands. We're active in uh, the Netherlands, Germany, and France. Um, and yeah, what you can see is that we deliver groceries, and we also have an app in which you can simply uh, order the order the groceries. I just wanted to share this. I think it's uh, I work for a really cool company who does these things. Uh, like I, I only talked about one tool, but yeah, we are so a tech focused uh, company. Um, yeah, it's really awesome to work for them. Um, so yeah, if you're interested, here is a, a list of vacancies. Uh, well, no, sorry, we have vacancies. There is a the QR code to get in contact with uh, one of the persons who can tell you more about it. Um, and on the top right is a uh, QR code for error prone support. Uh, there is some explanation there, also the Gradle things uh, that you asked, and uh, more information on all the things I showed you. Um, yeah, uh, I found it really cool to do this deep dive. Uh, so thank you all for your input, effort, and uh, questions. So thank you. So, uh, are there questions? Yes. Spotbugs, Checkstyle, and Sonar Cloud. Yeah. Um, we used all of them. I think, if I, I want to be 100% correct, Spotbugs we don't currently use anymore because there was not enough checks in there that we uh, didn't already have. But the others, yes. Other questions? Yeah. Go ahead. PMD. Uh, Spot is, oh yeah, um, yeah. Sorry, I was misremembering. Uh, no, we don't use it. Um, also, I don't think there are that many checks that we think, hey, are adding so so much value. 
unless we miss some uh, something, then uh, we are of course open to uh, to uh, introducing that. We would like that if there are nice uh, checks. Question. Yeah. If there's a tool that can provide, sorry, can you talk a little bit louder? Um, for, from which part are you, are you talking about, sorry? Yeah. In different, oh yes, okay, yeah, sorry, I, I get it now. Um, I used a simple bash script for that to say, hey, uh, now run error prone with this refast rule collection, then with this one, just like I did with the, um, uh, with the quick GitHub uh, page I showed you where I run, ran only one check. I did the same, but then for refaster I said all, uh, like this specific refaster rule collection, uh, please run it, then make a commit, and uh, so I create a bash script for that. Um, good question. Other questions? To chain templates. Yeah, what we, so I, I mentioned the patch script. What that basically does is it says, hey, Run all error prone checks, refast rules, everything. Uh, is there a git? Uh, if you do git diff, is there a diff? Then please do it again because you introduce changes uh, and then try to run it till there are no further changes. So, yes, you can definitely chain them like that, but you maybe meant differently. That's the only way you can chain them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so if you're Applying a refast rule, and it's, um, I would say that it's another rewrite com comes available, or another refast rule would trigger on that, you would have to run it twice. Because uh, you rewrite something, and then uh, when you apply that in the code, it needs to recompile that to understand, like, can I apply this change again or not? Explicit control over the order in which you run the, the rules? No, you don't have that. Good question. Not a question. Okay, then there's one thing to say. I also have some stickers here, uh, one of the custom stickers I talked about, of course. So please come and fetch them. Uh, but apart from that, thanks again. <laughs>